Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center webinar. Um, as you probably know, uh, this is the first of a two-part series of webinars that we're holding uh, to focus on pedestrian and bicycle count data. Uh, so today's session is going to focus mainly on developing count programs and understanding the data, uh, and we'll get into a little bit more about what we'll cover today. Um, but then the session coming up on Thursday, uh, part two, is going to take a closer look at counting equipment. Uh, so we encourage you to attend both parts if you can. Uh, many of you are probably signed up for both, but uh, if you haven't yet registered for Thursday, uh, we'll be here back here at the same time. My name is Dan Jolene. Um, I'm a program manager with the Pedestrian Bicycle Information Center, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, we're very lucky to be joined by an excellent group of panelists uh, today, uh, so I'd like to introduce them now. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Krista Nordback, uh, who is a senior research associate here at the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. Uh, she'll be providing an overview of count programs, uh, why we need them, and what to consider when developing your own. Uh, Scott Brady uh, manages the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission's Office of Travel Monitoring. Uh, he'll be sharing some examples uh, from count programs in the Philadelphia area and focusing in particular on factoring uh, count data. Uh, Jeremy Raw uh, works in the FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Planning, where he facilitates research and deployment of advanced modeling and data analysis techniques for transportation planning. Uh, he'll be sharing some findings from a count pilot program as well as some, as some information about the Traffic Monitoring Analysis System, or TMAS, which you'll learn more about today. Uh, finally, uh, Kelly Lawson is with us. She's a senior engineer with Kittleson and & Associates, uh, and she'll be sharing some information about the recently revised 2016 Federal Bicycle and Pedestrian Count Data Format. Uh, so we're thrilled to have all of the panelists uh, here with us today. Uh, we very much look forward to all of their presentations uh, in the subsequent discussion. Um, I've also, or now, I, what I'd like to do quickly is just shift gears uh, and for a moment and talk through a few housekeeping items. Um, I'd like to ask uh, all the attendees, uh, if you can hear me, uh, please click the hand icon located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, that's just going to let us know that the webinar is working uh, and that you can hear us. Um, so I'm just going to take a look and see if I see uh, hands going up. And sure enough, there they are. Welcome, everybody. Glad you all could join us today. Uh, we've got a very exciting presentation. I'm glad you all are with us to hear all about it. Uh, if for any reason uh, your computer freezes up during the webinar, we encourage you to please just reload the website and log back into the program. Uh, you will be able to rejoin uh, the session. We have already posted presentation slides uh, of the webinar today. Uh, we will share that link with you very shortly. Uh, we will be posting a recording of the webinar, uh, so you'll be able to look back at anything you missed. Uh, the presentation slides are available now. The video likely will be up within the next 24 hours or so. Um, please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar, although you will have the ability uh, to submit uh, questions to us and comments using the chat feature, and we encourage you to do that during the webinar. You can ask questions at any time. Uh, we'll be holding around 25 to 30 minutes at the very end uh, for a discussion session with our panelists. Later today, you're going to be receiving a follow-up email um, from the UNC Highway Safety Research Center with a few pieces of information. So one thing it'll contain uh, is a link to the page where you can access the webinar slides from today as well as the uh, webinar recording. Uh, it's also going to include a link uh, that will allow you to download a certificate of attendance uh, for attending the webinar today. So the certificate of attendance uh, will come to you if you're the one who registered but if you have others attending the webinar with you, we encourage you to share that link with those uh, folks as well so that they can also uh, print out a certificate of attendance. Um, the webinar has been submitted by, uh, to the American Planning Association uh, for 1.5 CM credits. Uh, so if that applies to you, I'd encourage you to please check the online AICP event calendar uh, for more information. Um, you can learn more about all of our webinars uh, by visiting pedbikeinfo.org uh, slash webinars. Uh, you can also keep up to date uh, on all the things we have going on on our Facebook page uh, and our Twitter account. Uh, those are both listed here as well, Ped Bike Info. Um, we're actually going to be uh, having some side discussions using our Twitter account today. So if you're interested in following along with that or participating, uh, we're using the hashtag PBIC webinar. Uh, so you can check that out. And then finally, if you're not already on our mailing list, uh, we'd like you to sign up if you, if you wouldn't mind to get all the announcements about our upcoming webinars, uh, pedbikeinfo.org slash sign up. Um, a few things that you may be, want to be aware of, you may be already. Um, again, our 
count series part two webinar is coming up uh, in two days on Thursday, so we encourage you to sign up for that. There's also going to be a webinar from the, Ameri uh, the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals, APDP, on June 21st. Um, that webinar is on the topic of counting as well, but it's sort of uh, called Beyond Counting, uh, putting uh, data to work for better planning and evaluation. And so you should uh, consider visiting APDP.org to learn more about that one and possibly sign up. Um, if you're interested in counts, we think it'll be an interesting session for you as well. Uh, and then we just announced our next webinar after the February 23rd uh, edition or episode. Uh, the March 14th webinar that we're going to be holding is uh, going to be focusing on preparing for successful safety, education, and enforcement activities for uh, bicycles, bicyclists and pedestrians. So if that's your area of interest, we encourage you to uh, check out our website and, and sign up for that one as well. We are uh, going to quickly uh, transition here into our first presentation, uh, but before we do, we have our first of a few poll questions that we'd like to uh, launch. And so um, this one has more to do with uh, giving us an understanding of how many people are out there today. Uh, so we'd encourage you to cast your votes here. Um, it may be just you attending from your computer. It may be you in a small group of two to three, possibly four to five people, uh, or maybe you have a larger group as well. So if you can just spend a bit of time uh, responding to this poll question, it's very valuable for us to understand how people attend our webinars and, um, and, and uh, view our sessions. Uh, so we'll wait for maybe another uh, 15 seconds, and then I'll close this up, and we will move on uh, to our first presentation. Okay, maybe about five more seconds on the poll question before we close it up. Okay, thanks everybody. I'm going to go ahead and close that now. Uh, we appreciate all of the information. And uh, what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Krista Nordback uh, for our uh, first presentation today. So Krista, uh, whenever you're ready, please go right ahead. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I'll be just giving a quick introduction on the subject of bicycle and pedestrian counting. Um, let's talk about why we're doing this and um, some lessons we can learn from the motor vehicle counting programs that have been going on for the last couple decades. Um, and then the evolution of non-motorized counting, bicycle and pedestrian counting, the state of the practice and some recommendations. So why are we counting? What, what's, in, what's in it? Um, we want to understand how many people are using the facilities. What does that mean for funding and policy decisions? We want to see change over time. Um, gives us information for how wide the sidewalk or path should be, um, planning decisions, economic impact, how many people are walking by a business or bicycling by that business, um, public health, do we have an active community, and safety, which is why the Highway Safety Research Center is so interested in this work. So there are many ways to understand bicycle and pedestrian volumes and traffic. Um, Surveys, you could take a survey of a community, uh, many levels. You could ask people to use their smart smartphone, to use an app, to do tra tracing of their trips during the day. But I'm going to focus, um, and the rest of the webinar series here is going to focus on the count data specifically, which can be used in addition to other data sources. Um, but let's focus on that. And I'm going to talk about two types of counting, permanent counters, also continuous counters, um, and short duration counts. So a permanent counter is counting 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. A short duration counter could be as little as 15 minutes or all the way up to months uh, of time. Um, and you could have a cyclic um, or a, a, a cyclical or a project-based count. So we'll be talking about those different types of counts. Um, let's see what we can learn from traffic monitoring programs. These have mostly been focused on motor vehicles. That's fortunately changing, but um, let's see what we can learn. So generally for motor vehicles, we have permanent counters that are um, inductive loops and short duration counters that are pneumatic tubes, um, and those are usually in place for 24 hours to 48 hours now. Um, here's an example from Oregon, and we see here um, that they're not counting on all the road segments, but many of them, trying to get it a good representative sample, and about 180 sites. And at those sites, we're counting 365 days a year, so we know the annual average daily traffic, because we can sum up all the counts throughout the year, divide by 365, 
and get a, a, a number. But what about all the other places where we want to know what's going on across the network? Well, we can't afford to put permanent count stations everywhere because they're expensive and they're hard to maintain. So instead, we send out short duration counts at all the other sites where we'd like to know what's going on. And you can see there are many, many more sites here in this particular road network. So at those sites where you're counting 24 or 48 hours, we don't know what the annual average daily traffic is. So what are we going to do? Well, we look at what's going on, on the, at the annual, uh, um, on the permanent count sites where we have a record of what's going on. And we can say, well, July tends to be higher volume than than the average. So we could take the count that was taken on a weekday in July and create some factor to adjust for how much that's higher than average and apply that factor to the short duration count and get an estimate of the annual average daily traffic. Scott is going to talk more about how specifically he did that um, for bicycling and walking in the Philadelphia area, um, but I just want to get you the general idea of, of the concept here. So can we apply this to cycling and walking? The, uh, yes, um, annual average daily pedestrian and bicycle traffic. This is the new acronym, AADPT and AADBT. I'm still trying to get used to it. Um, new acronym from FHWA, which is AADT for walking and biking. And this has evolved. Um, uh, back in 2004, we were um, focusing a lot on, on manual counts when the National Bike Ped Documentation Project started. And it's kind of evolving to more automated counts as the equipment um, has evolved. And here you can see uh, we have a, a um, inductive loop combined with an infrared counter for a permanent site so that you can filter out the bicycles and pedestrians because they're both warm bodies, so they're both counted by the infrared, but only the bicycles are counted by the inductive loop. And even for portable sites, we can combine tubes, which count bicycles, with infrared that count warm bodies, subtract one from the other to get the pedestrian. So um, innovations in counting equipment have helped. So let's go back in time um, and look at the original um, National Bike Head Documentation Project. Here the focus was on two-hour counts, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and sometimes weekends. Mid-September was really a focus, and they asked people to count um, preferably more than one day during that time period. Then in 2013, we had the traffic monitoring guide revision that included a chapter four specifically for non-motorized traffic and included discussion of permanent and short duration counts for biking and walking. It was updated recently in 2016, and we now have a new chapter, or sorry, a new revision to chapter four and revision to chapter seven that includes format for um, entering bicycle and pedestrian data into the Travel Monitoring Analysis System, TMAP, and Jeremy and Kelly will be talking about that later. We also have NCHRP 797 that is an excellent reference in terms of setting up a program and um, a lot of information on equipment, how to validate your equipment, some great information there. Frank Pru is going to be talking about that on Thursday at our next webinar, so I hope you can all attend because he's going to share the latest, greatest from that project, which continues to, to do some work in this area. And I'm very excited to hear what he'll have to share with us. Um, and also, Kelly has been on that project and can probably answer some questions if for some reason you have them today on equipment. Um, OK, so um, state of the practice, non-motorized counting programs. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to have uh, Jeremy and Scott talking about some programs from MPOs. Um, so I thought I'll talk about state programs briefly. In the state of the practice there, Washington um, has, uh, in 2008, started their manual counting program. And recently, they've augmented that with permanent counters. Colorado started in 2009 with permanent counters and has also do, do uh, short duration counts and automated counts uh, using infrared and tubes. North Carolina also has a program. I'm going to talk about that in a sec. And uh, many other states are getting into this uh, process. So let's talk briefly about an example state, North Carolina. Um, here you can see they're combining for their permanent site the loops with the infrared. Here the infrared is on a pole counting on the sidewalk. 
Um, and the inductive loop is counting the bicycles in the roadway. And for their um, short duration count sites, they have a, a tube. And you can see the tube is only in the bike lane here. And then the uh, infrared counting the pedestrians on the sidewalk. Um, they started with a small region, and they're expanding out now. But this is their pilot site, so you can see where they installed those sites around the state. Now let's go to an example of a city. This is Blacksburg, Virginia in the mountains, a, a small college town. Many other cities are doing great work, but I just want to focus on one example to show what can be done. Um, so this is the work of um, Lou and, and Steve Hankey and um, Ralph Bueller and others there at Virginia Tech. Um, they have four permanent counters that they've installed and 97 short duration counts. Um, and from that, they have been able to estimate the bicycle and pedestrian annual average daily traffic on their network. And you can see their map here um, that the bicycle volumes are um, from uh, up to 100, over 100 bicyclists annual average, and 500 for pedestrians. They selected sites for their permanent counters. Um, around their network, and they were looking at different types of facilities. So here you can see they've chosen a uh, path, but also um, some roadway sites. And they were looking to capture different types of patterns. Some may be the school commute pattern associated with the university. Others may be more recreational patterns. Others may be uh, more of a commute pattern. So they wanted to capture all of these different patterns. Then for choosing their short duration sites, you can see they are also distributed across their network. And they stratified the types of locations by the road type. So here we have local roads, off-street trails, and major roads. So they wanted to, I think they were able to sample, from speaking to them, they were able to sa sample most of their major roads and off-street trails. But then local roads, they had to come up with a little bit uh, more detailed strategy because they couldn't sample all of them. And I just wanted to show this photo where they're uh, doing tube counts on the sidewalk as well as the roadway to capture bicyclists riding on the sidewalk. So in conclusion, we can recommend that having both permanent counters and short duration counters is critical. If you just have permanent counters, you cannot know what's going on throughout your network because you cannot afford to install those everywhere. If you just have short duration counts, you do not know what's going on throughout the year, and you can never understand the annual average daily traffic at, that, at any of your sites. So it's critical that you have both in your, your study. OK. Um, when you're doing short duration counts, the state of the practice it seems to be about seven days is recommended. Um, if you can, can count in the high volume months, please do. That's when you have less variation. So for example, if you're in Minnesota, don't count in February or um, uh, December. And then e for validating equipment, um, that's very important. Sarah O'Brien from ITRI uh, at North Carolina State will be talking about that tomorrow, as part, or sorry, Thursday, as part of our webinar. And I hope you can make it because she's going to um, tell us some valuable information about how to validate equipment. But it's critical that that's done also. Um, because otherwise you don't know if your equipment is giving you any useful information. Um, site selection, permanent counters, be, you have a great chance to spend time thinking about where to put those in. Uh, you want to capture different patterns. If you can put in a, a short duration count before you install those, that's very valuable to know what kind of pattern you have. Or even if you just do a manual count at the site, to understand are, are bicyclists riding on the sidewalk, in the road, how are people using the facility? Where should you put the counter? Um, and you want to try to get some locations with, with higher volume, um, because otherwise, if you're, if you're looking at 10 bicyclists per day, it can be kind of boring. Uh, you can't do much with that. And short duration counts, um, project counts, and cyclical counts, um, you want to do before and after. But you also need to make sure you have enough um, distribution across your network whether you do a stratified sample or some other um, strategy. So thanks so much for your attention. Really appreciate it. And I'll turn it back to Dan. Great. Thanks, Krista. Um, we are, we're going to do another quick poll question uh, before we move on and hear from Scott Brady. So 
uh, take a look at your screen and let us know um, if you, we, we want to hear basically about your programs um, that you've got going on. So if you have uh, a, a PEDBIKE uh, accounting program, if this is a relevant question for you, let us know um, which of these fits you sort of describes your community, uh, your program is. Manual short duration counts only, uh, automated uh, short duration only, permanent count programs only, or do you have both short duration and permanent? Um, or, or you don't have one, that's fine too. We're, we're very curious about um, your experience um, doing this and, and uh, what, what you all bring to the table. So um, I think that uh, a lot of the folks in this room, in this, on this panel um, and others we work with are, are developing new resources to help communities uh, in their development of uh, head bike count programs. So anything that we can learn from you about what you need uh, is very valuable. So uh, we'll just take maybe another uh, 20 seconds on this poll question and then we'll go ahead and uh, switch things over to Scott. Okay. All right, uh, a couple more seconds on the poll and we'll close it down. Okay, well thank you all very much for that. Um, we are gonna um, move right along here um, and, uh, and switch things over um, to Scott. So Scott, take a look at your screen. You should get an alert come across and ask you to take over and um, go full with your slides. All righty. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Perfect. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Well, follow, I, I think Krista pretty much said it all, so uh, I, this is my opening and closing slide. Uh, she did really well. I'm going to go into a little bit more uh, detail about the factoring process. And the question becomes, why doesn't page down work? Okay. Hmm. There we go. Uh, why do we use factors? And as Krista pointed out, factors, we use them to translate short duration counts to AADBT and AADPT. Uh, on the motorized side, we have the AADT. Uh, the AADB and AADP is used for trend analysis and planning purposes on the non-motorized side. <clears throat> and again, the factoring allows the results of a short duration count, uh, which I abbreviate to SDC. Uh, recommended by the uh, traffic monitoring guide to be a seven-day count, to be mathematically transformed into an annual average volume to be used in planning applications. Now, there are two factors that uh, DVRPC deals with. This is one of our count sheets for a pedestrian count. And the first of these is an equipment factor. Now, uh, this equipment factor corrects for under or overcounting by the equipment, although undercounting is by far the most, most prevalent occurrence. There are many reasons for undercounting. Two of the most common examples are number one, occlusion. Uh, this is where two people are walking exactly abreast and the counter picks only up, up only one heat signature. A second reason is babies and coaches and very small children. Due to the technology, the sensor has to be placed at hip height Otherwise, each leg of an adult would be tallied as a pedestrian. Um, by definition, the sensor then misses babies in carriages or walking past the sensor. And legally, they are, they are uh, pedestrians and should be counted. What you're seeing here is a somewhat truncated uh, uh, spreadsheet where we actually did the um, validation of our pedestrian equipment. Uh, for that process, we selected five locations in Center City, Philadelphia with different facing materials, stone, uh, brick, glass, different widths of the sidewalk. And we went out there and at each of those five locations, we set up the equipment and then we did a manual monitoring for 10 hours. So we had 50 hours of uh, validation that covered 25,000 pedestrians and we had a 6.22% under count. Now, the equipment should be validated when it's first purchased. Ideally, a revalidation procedure should be undertaken each year. This is also a handy way to check the performance of the units. A unit that is beginning to experience component failure will be identified in this process. Ah, 
love how that works. The second factor is a seasonal factor. Calculating this factor is more complicated, and I'll spend most of the discussion on this factor. The Traffic Monitoring Guide by uh, Federal Highway Administration identifies three main types of count programs that Krista alluded to. Permanent count program, project counts, for instance, the Tiger Grant program, uh, which is used to construct many trails, uh, bike lanes, etc., requires a before count, before construction, and three years of counts after the project is completed. And finally, the cyclical count program. Permanent continuous counters provide ongoing data for the locations in which they are deployed, but they also allow for the development of region-specific seasonal adjustment factors. When applied to the week-long counts or short duration counts, these adjustment factors help us estimate total annual traffic and average daily traffic. Now, different from the motorized side, where permanent stations span the state, as you saw in the slide of Oregon, and therefore a variety of weather situations simultaneously, the local nature of non-motorized programs have stations that deal with homogeneous weather, a benefit since use of the non-motorized modes is very sensitive to weather conditions. So. Again, we say that these uh, permanent stations collect data continuously. They're organized into factor groups. And when we say factor groups, we're referring to the seasonal factors. These locations are organized by their travel characteristics, by the pattern of their uh, travel. And again, this <coughs> data is used to develop those seasonal correction factors. PBRPC installed 15 permanent counters uh, to start on the multi-use trails. Some of those are pictured on the uh, right-hand side. Uh, they use an infrared sensor uh, for pedestrians and bikes, and then an inductive loop to distinguish out the bikes. They, as I said, uh, con continuously collect data. It's batched in 15-minute increments. We have by direction and by mode. This is a map of our region, our nine-county region, showing the location of 15. Uh, and then there's a real light location right here called the Bar Bartram's Mile, and this is actually going to be our 16th location. Now, the original 15, or 12 of the uh, original, I want to say was generously supported by the William Penn Foundation. Uh, these counters, all acquired from EcoCounter, collect and report data continuously. They use a combination of infrared sensor and inductive loop. Uh, due to the success of those initial 12, we were approached by the Pennsylvania Environmental Council, which sponsored an additional three locations, the DNL Canal Trail, both north and south of the tie-in to the East Coast Greenway, and an additional location on the Schuylkill River Trail here in Conshohocken. Now we have people knocking at the door, wanting to sponsor locations, and I, I say enough already, it's time to move on to uh, in-street locations. When you're considering a site for a permanent installation, it is best to conduct a short duration count and graph the data to determine the travel pattern. Because this way you don't end up with, let's say, 15 stations that are all recreation pattern. You want to have that good mix, like uh, Krista said. Okay, and the location should be chosen not based on the highest volumes, but to achieve a mix of travel patterns which will aid in the development of the seasonal correction factors. On the motorized side of travel monitoring, we have permanent stations on all classifications of roadways in the ur urban and rural area types. We don't seek to only gather data on the interstates, but look to gather a variety of travel data on a variety of facilities to help us understand travel and turn our 48-hour counts into AADT. So what we have here is one of our locations, the Schuylkill River Trail of Kelly Drive. Again, I had to truncate the uh, analysis sheet um, to be able to put it here on the slide. Now, this is a classic example of a location that is a mix of utilitarian, in this case commutation, and recreation pattern. You can see the eastbound spike here in the morning weekday, and the westbound spike in the afternoon. In addition, however, you have heavy afternoon volumes in both directions. Where's my little cursor? There it is relying the fact that people are using the trail for late afternoon recreation purposes. The weekend plots here Saturday and below it Sunday 
show the classic midday humps of a recreation pattern. Another example would be the Chester Valley Trail, and this demonstrates a purely recreational pattern. Weekdays show a late afternoon hump for both eastbound and westbound travel, and this is after work recreation, while the weekends display the typical midday hump. Now you can see two peaks here, but if you look at the times, they're only two hours apart, so this is really not a commute on Sunday. Due to the fluid nature of travel, the process of determining factor groups should be repeated every year when you initiate annual factor development. Although many locations will show travel pattern stability, a facility extension, interconnection, or other item can change the character of travel. An example of this is the Kenwood Heritage Trail, where an extension over the Schuylkill River to the Maniunk neighborhood added a significant com commute component from Maniunk to the employers along City Avenue. And here this graph shows that uh, you know we're going along here, and that's not because it was raining all along the early part here, but all of a sudden we had the Maniunk Bridge Trail opening. And you'll notice, yes, you see this giant jump on the weekends here and here. But really, I, I would tend to put that down to be uh, people riding out to see what it's all about. The bridge that it goes over is a historic railway bridge. Uh, what's really interesting here is if you look at the weekday, and you see these volumes weekday, uh, you see the increase versus here more than double. And that's the commutation pattern to uh, employers along City Avenue. So what do we do with all that data? Well, we now have some factor groups. Uh, the three that we identified in 2015 on the trail system were mixed utilitarian and recreation factor. When I say utilitarian because we don't have enough stations yet to break out commutation and, for instance, university travel. Once we do, then we will attempt to break those out. We had uh, a factor group by the Chester Valley Trail and several others that were purely recreational. And we had a third group, which I call low volume evenly distributed factor group, uh, which were locations that have very low volumes right now, but they you know, have trail extensions planned and such. So let's take this first one, mixed utilitarian. Then we had two locations which qualified uh, for that factor group, the Schuylkill River Trail at Kelly Drive and the Wissipkin Trail. We go through and we post the volumes for each of the 365 days in, in 2015 at each of the locations. And we summarize those here. Okay, and then it, what we'll do is for that factor group, we'll add up the daily total at the combined locations to get the total volume in for the year, which was here just shy of 600,000. Divide it by 365, and we have the average daily for that factor group. Now, the variance of any one of these days to that average yields your adjustment factor for a count taken on January 1st, Thursday. And here I, I show it again here. We have an average daily for recreational of 523. Variance between 129 and 523 is 4, um, and so forth. What I've done here is I've actually brought up, because in that I also put up the weather information to show uh, the effects of the weather and how important it is that that be taken into account. We looked at many different ways to apply factors to get the best results. Due to the effects that weather has on non-motorized travel, it was determined that having a correction factor for each day of the year was best. I know on the motorized side in many states what they do is a day of week within month. But a snowfall on a particular day would not affect other days the way using a day of week factor would. In this slide is very noticeable the effects that weather has on individual factors. So even here on the day when we say it's snow and the temperatures are such, you have almost a regular amount of travel. This tells me that this snow was late in the day and you can see the effect it had on the next day. Temperatures plummeted, 21 at the high, 9 degrees is the low, and the volumes actually plummeted. So we have a total at these two locations of 11 
bicyclists, leading to an enormous seasonal correction factor for a count taken on Sunday, January 15th. So if I have a short duration count somewhere else in seven days and it includes Sunday the 15th, I'm going to have to apply this number, 149.199, times the regular volume to achieve the ADV. Now the cyclical count program, which Chris also talked about, uh, we actually have about 3,300 short duration uh, bicycle counts right now. And she was like, when we were talking, she was like, oh, you should put up a map of all your locations. And I just laughed and I said, it would just be a, a massive blog. Uh, but I did pu pull up the uh, cyclical count program. There are about 150 locations on our cyclical count. They're done with pneumatic tubes, uh, short duration counts, which is what's shown in the picture here. And uh, a variety of locations. They're uh, on protected bike lanes, bike lanes, sharrows, striped shoulders, mixed traffic, trails, side paths. Uh, we tried to, to get a good mix and a good mix of volumes. Now, the, when you uh, take a short duration count, you actually have to as assign it to a pattern group in order to get the correct seasonal correction factor. So for each short duration count, the volume should be graphed in or the same way we did earlier with the uh, permanent stations in order to assign the location to a factor group. In this way, the correct seasonal correction factor will be applied. The good news is that this process can be substantially automated. Let me tell you, that is good news if you're in my shoes. The bad news is that the character of travel may change over time due to a trail extension or tie-in as previously discussed. For example, you cannot assume that the pattern group is the same as it was the previous time the site was counted. So if you have a cyclical, this is if this were a cyclical uh, location, we would have counted it three years ago, and then we go out and count it again. We can't just assume it. We need to regraph it. And again, I've truncated the uh, uh, the actual data, plotted it, and you can see the, the uh, how we assign it. So in summary, I want to say that you, there are some very important points. Number one, validate your equipment when it's new and annually thereafter to cali uh, calculate your equipment factor. Conduct a short duration count at candidate permanent site to determine travel patterns. Select sites to get a varied mix. Group permanent sites by the travel pattern factor groups and use those volumes to calculate seasonal correction factors for a given year. Graph the short duration count data as it comes in to assign the location to a factor group and apply equipment and seasonal factors to estimate AADBT and AADPT. That's a lot of, a lot of letters. So I'd like to thank you all for uh, listening and uh, turn it back over to Dan. Great. Thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, very good presentation. We uh, are going to move things over uh, to Jeremy in just a moment. But before we do that, I actually wanted to, uh, I was reminded that I never shared the results of our previous poll question. So I'm going to do that now uh, with the audience so you can see what everyone said to our last question. So as a reminder, we were asking about uh, the different types of uh, count programs that people are, are using or are uh, managing around the country. So I'm just showing you the results here. Uh, it looks like most people um, don't actually have uh, count programs or they're not aware of one in their, in their communities. Uh, and then there was a sort of a tie for those who have manual short duration programs and uh, and then those who have both short duration and permanent. Um, and then it looks like the le least selected option was a permanent count program only. So that's very helpful for us to see. I think it um, it, it tells us a lot about, about what you are working on and, and maybe some of the uh, resources and questions you might have. So um, we are going to um, move right along with our presentations now. I am going to turn things over uh, to Jeremy. Uh, raw to uh, to share some information about the count pilot program, the traffic monitoring guide, and some work going on uh, from Federal Highway Administration's perspective. So, uh, Jeremy, I just sent you the screen. Let me know if you're able to. Uh, oh, perfect! I see your slides. So please uh, go right ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Let me take myself off mute. I got the screen to work now. He has to get the words to work. Uh, so, as uh, Dan mentioned, I work in the Office of Planning at the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, this is a sister office to the Office of Human Environment where the main bicycle and pedestrian program lives. And what the Office of Planning does 
is provide support uh, and coordination for the federal aid highway program planning requirements. We work with state departments of transportation and metropolitan planning organizations to improve the quality of their planning practice. And that's, that's important because the two things that I'm going to be talking about this afternoon are related to support for bicycle and pedestrian counting within MPOs and later uh, state DOTs and also the national federal government itself. So I, I'm kind of excited to talk about this. Uh, we'll carry on to the next point. The first thing I'm going to talk about is our uh, what we uh, gracefully call the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization Bicycle and Pedestrian Count Technology Deployment Pilot Program, uh, which is a giant mouthful. But what we decided to do with this program, which we launched two years ago and, and which completed uh, last year, was to try and find out what it would take for metropolitan planning organizations to set up systematic bicycle and pedestrian counting programs. And so we funded ten agencies with relatively small grants to enable them to buy some equipment, set it up, try it out, and see what happened. We also provided them with some technical support in the form of webinars and gathered together some amount of documentation on how to set up these programs. All of this has been published in a guidebook. I think Dan's probably putting the link up in the chat pod for you, and we've got the link on the slide here. I'm not actually going to go through the report because I want to keep what I'm saying short to make as much room as possible for Kelly Lawson, who's going to talk about me, uh, talk about a project that uh, we helped do in a minute uh, that's relevant to my next talk. But anyway, pick up that report. You'll find out that it's actually relatively easy for organizations to set up count programs. It doesn't cost an enormous amount of money. Uh, and these organizations, many of whom were starting completely from scratch with respect to bicycle and pedestrian uh, uh, data monitoring, uh, were able to pull off quite a feat in terms of getting programs together, looking at interesting technologies, trying out different locations. Uh, and I'm, I'm reasonably pleased to say that most of them are actually carrying on the program and actually enlarging it beyond what we did in the pilot. Uh, the programs that we actually supported were in 10 communities across the country. There's a map here just in case you're curious about who these folks were. Uh, we tried to reach for a ge geographic spread didn't completely cover it. There's a lot of missing stuff in the middle of the country there, and we're contemplating a second round of this. So if you're in one of those places that looks particularly blank on this map, feel free to drop me an email in case we get around to that. The second thing I wanted to talk about uh, beyond the MPO Camp Technology Deployment Pilot Project uh, is the thing that uh, Krista alluded to in her presentation earlier, the traffic monitoring analysis system. This is a system that we've had in place for probably about 10 years. Uh, I may have the date wrong, and I can hear Stephen Jesperger wincing in the background already. Uh, this is a national database of motorized counts that we've been keeping for some time. It has a standard data format. We apply consistent quality checks. And we use the system to monitor trends in travel to support research and traffic forecasting and safety. Uh, and to generally do transportation system performance management. I've got a link here to the uh, uh, home page for this travel monitoring page that we have from our Office of Highway Policy Information. The motorized section of, of uh, TMAS, as we call it, the Traffic Monitoring Analysis System, collects all automated motorized counts from across the United States. So we get an immense amount of data funneled regularly into the system. This is the basis for reports that are regularly published out of our Office of Highway Policy Information, the traffic volume trends that are what amounts to the definitive statement of how much motorized travel is happening in the country from uh, one year to the next. TMAS also complements the highway performance monitoring system, which is a major data source. Every state is required to report the, the uh, usage of the roads in their state, and that's actually used for federal funding allocations. So TMAS provides an important validation of what happens to the highway performance monitoring system. The data for TMAS is submitted monthly, every month, by every state DOT. And so they'll systematically gather up all the counts that they're collecting at their automated locations and send them on to us. And so at this point, you're wondering, what does this have to do with bicycle and pedestrian stuff? You'll recall that when Krista described the traffic monitoring guide, which is the basis for the data format that TMAS uses, she mentioned that we had added, uh, back in 2013, a section on bicycle and pedestrian counts how to collect those counts. And the book also talks about how to collect motorized counts. In fact, that's historically been what it's been about. 
That gave us license to go and extend the traffic monitoring analysis system to allow us to collect bicycle and pedestrian count. So it's not yet a comprehensive database. In fact, it's not a database at all because we haven't opened it for submissions yet. We're still in the final throes of doing the IT implementation, getting the database and user interface set up. We've been working with a lot of people in the field, including Scott, Krista, and others, to make sure that the system actually will handle the data as, as well as possible. Part of the reason for doing the 2016 update that Chris mentioned was because in the course of working up the database, we discovered some limitations in the format and wanted to correct those so that we could go out and actually be prepared to collect the counts that people are actually taking in the field. So unlike the motorized section of TMAS, when we open up the non-motorized part, we're going to open it to any agency that has, has a working count program. Uh, you, anybody who wants to submit to this will have to do a, a, a sort of memorandum of agreement with us that basically says you're going to promise to help us make sure that the counts are correct, as technically valid as possible, and so on. I mean, it's not onerous, but we want people to be in it for the long haul, because the real value of this resource is in developing a long-term uh, record of what's happened in different locations across the country. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in order to use TMAS, a user account is required. We are working for both the motorized and non-motorized data on, um, <coughs> excuse me, on uh, actually making the data available so you can go in and do visualizations of data in the system and have it publicly available. That's going to come down the road. Uh, we're also working on a couple of pilot projects with state DOTs, and I will mention that a secret inner objective of setting up TMAS the way we have is to try and get state DOTs to take a more active hand in watching bicycle and pedestrian activity, understanding it as part of what happens on the roadway system, and essentially creating parallel uh, structures, both technically, planning-wise, and so on, uh, for bicycle and pedestrian work, comparable to what's done with motorized traffic. The ultimate goal is to try and have us see a unified surface transportation system that includes all of these modes where we can develop performance measures set targets and basically have all of this uh, equally handled by everybody regardless of the mode. So the data submission that goes into TMAS and the information that actually arrives there comes in the traffic monitoring guide format. So Kevin's going to talk about a resource that we spent some effort developing to make the extremely uh, terse and obscure description of the data format in the traffic monitoring guide itself something that is vibrant and accessible to people who might actually collect and submit the counts. Uh, the key thing that we are doing with TMAS and the thing that's going to make it a really useful report uh, resource ultimately is that the quality checking for all the data that comes in is comprehensive. You'll remember that I said if you want to sign up and submit counts, you are going to agree to work with us to try and get those counts in good shape, find places that suggest equipment might not be working, look for inconsistencies in the data that might suggest something has gone wrong. Uh, our, our ultimate goal is not to allow garbage, but uh, and any data that we accept is going to have to pass the basic quality checks. And we've worked extensively all up to this point and will continue to do so with agencies collecting counts to make sure that the quality checks are not just screening for bad data, but actually helping the people who do the counts improve the quality of their program. When we first set this up and open it, we're probably going to let pretty much anything into the database, although things that do not pass our quality checks will be heavily flagged for the people who are trying to do research or trend analysis later will be able to identify data that might be questionable for some reason or another, not to say it's bad. And we're hoping over time to develop a lot of resources about how to check the data, what sorts of thresholds are reasonable, uh, and be able to go forward with that. My own ultimate hope, since I'm a modeling guy and somebody who's really interested in, in the sort of forecasting and analysis, is that we can really use this later to provide the basis for very effective uh, usage and safety modeling tools. So people can look at the existing database, develop tools that are based on that, and have a really good sense of what's going to happen if they build projects in certain contexts, what will it do for safety, what will it do for mobility, and so on. We're also going to be coordinating this with development of performance measures, complementing a guide that we published uh, last year on how to develop performance measures for bicycle and walking. 
So that's the gist of my presentation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there, just put up a couple of names, mine and also Stephen Jesperger, who's the program manager for TMAS as, as a whole. Uh, the two of us have been working very closely on the non-motorized extensions. If you have questions, you can drop down our emails and drop us, uh, drop us a message. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dan, and we'll carry on. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, very exciting, all the news that's going on, uh, things that are happening with TMAS. And uh, in that, in the light of what you presented, we, we do have another poll question we were going to launch right now uh, to get a sense of uh, those folks out there after hearing about all of this. Exciting news. Um, can you tell us if you're interested in either providing or using uh, data, uh, uh, either providing data to uh, TMAS eventually, or maybe using others' data that's submitted, if you're interested in providing and using data that's submitted, or if you don't really have any interest at this time? If you can let us know, um, that, that, that will certainly help uh, Jeremy and some of the others here who are, who are working on this to get a sense of um, who it is out there and how many are out there who would, who would get some use out of this data. So uh, I, again, we'll take not much more time, maybe uh, maybe 10 more seconds on this poll question to see if anybody can uh, cast a cast a response, and uh, and then I'll remember to share the results right afterwards, so you all can see what everyone else is saying. Just a few more few more seconds. Question came in: uh, If you do not currently have data, but you'd like to submit it when you do, I think that qualifies. Certainly, uh, you don't necessarily have to have data yet. You might be um, starting a program soon and eventually will have that data, so I think that's certainly uh, acceptable to, to put in. Okay, I am going to uh, go ahead and close the poll, and I uh, will share the results. So um, the good news is that most people are interested in both using and contributing data. Uh, and it only works, I guess, Jeremy, right, if, uh, if people not only use it but also contribute it. So that's good to see. Um, yeah. The 5% five percent interested in only contributing data Hopefully, you'll also want to uh, think about using it uh, as well. Jeremy, any thoughts you have after seeing this? That's great. All right. Well, yeah, great, great, exactly. Um, so we'll we'll go ahead and move right along here because we have one more really good presentation to get to before our discussion. So I'm going to hand controls over to uh, Kelly Lawson uh, with Kittleson and Associates to uh, continue the uh, oops continue the presentation. So um, Kelly, you should see. The alert come across your screen and you should be able to take it over and move right right, right ahead. Uh, great. So I don't know if I've seen the alert yet. Okay, that's all right. Um, we will take it back and then Kelly, let's let's see if this works now. Uh, great. I just got it. Let me just get it set up. Great. So can you guys see the presentation now? Does that work? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, again, my name is Kelly Lawson with Kittleson, and I'm excited to talk a little bit today, kind of building off um, the other presentation specifically about the format provided in the traffic monitoring guide for um, collecting and submitting non-motorized account uh, data. So I'm going to talk primarily about the resource that Jeremy mentioned that we spent the last uh, year, year and a half developing with definitely a lot of great input from a variety of, of people. So primarily I want this presentation to be the opportunity to give you a little introduction to the guidance document so that you know it's out there and you know what you can expect from it and how it can be used. So we won't have time to go into a, a lot of details, but I'm going to kind of gloss over some of the highlights of the guidance document. So this just lists the organization of the guidebook. So it's intended to serve um, a couple of purposes. Um, first, to provide an introduction to the TMG format, and then to go into kind of further description than provided in the TMG about the different elements of the format, kind of the two components that I'll talk about a little bit more later in my presentation, the count station description and also the count data. And then it also provides a section really intended to provide guidance on what to do if you're collecting multiple counts at a single location and some kind of insight into how that gets then translated into the format in the traffic monitoring guide. 
And finally, and I think potentially the most useful part of the document is the last section that provides a variety of examples for a variety of different facility types to help you see how you would actually go from account that you're collecting to getting the station location and data into the format. So to give you guys a little bit more of an introduction to the TMG format, um, as Krista mentioned, the Traffic Monitoring Guide, the most recent version, includes a section 7.9 and 7.10 that introduce the non-motorized format for the Traffic Monitoring Guide. And really, as I think Jeremy indicated, the intent is to create a format that's flexible um, but also allows for kind of a comprehensive information to be provided. So there's kind of this balancing act of wanting the format to be as, as simple as possible, as easy to use, but also needing to provide for a variety of different counting scenarios. Those of you that have collected bicycle pedestrian data before know it's um, unfortunately not normally as simple or straightforward as collecting motorized data in terms of users have a variety of different paths. Uh, there's a lot of different options that a bicyclist or a pedestrian might take even just on a, on a roadway segment between potentially a bike lane or a sidewalk or a multi-use path. And um, sometimes the facility, if it's not along a roadway, it might be harder to describe. So really trying to strike strike that balance. And then the goal of the guidebook that we developed, as Jeremy indicated, is really to try and make this format more accessible. And we tried to write it so that somebody that's just getting into collecting bicycle and pedestrian data but really has that interest in providing the data to um, FHWA and for others to be able to use can get that data that they're collecting into the format successfully. And I referenced this at the beginning, um, and those of you that are familiar with the TMG format um, may be familiar with this already, but for those that aren't, so the Traffic Monitoring Guide non-motorized format includes two types of records that need to be submitted. The first is a count station description uh, record, sometimes commonly recurred or referred to as the location record. And this really describes where the counts are collected, what's counted, uh, and how it's counted. And then the second component is the non-motorized count record, which is the counts themselves, um, but also includes information about when the counts are collected um, and some descriptions, um, further descriptions of the counts. So that's kind of the, the broad introduction to these two different types of records that need to be provided for any count data that's collected and submitted. And so I'll talk about each of those a little bit and give a little bit of a sample of some of the guidance that's provided um, in this guidebook. So the first piece of information, as I said, is a count station description, uh, commonly referred to as the location. And this describes primarily where the count was collected, but it also talks about what was counted and how it was counted. So this example here is a image from the guidebook, and it um, to help people understand kind of how many different station location records are needed for their count that they're collecting. So in this example, this is a location in Portland where it's a shared use path, and there's pedestrians and cyclists traveling in both directions. And because of what the uh, location station location record includes, you might need to have more than one station location record depending on what you're counting. So if you're just counting the total number of multimodal users in both directions, kind of overall using this facility, one station location record's sufficient. But if you want to actually record the total number of cyclists and the total number of pedestrians separately, you need two station location records because they're mode specific. And if you were to want to count just the number of pedestrians but indicate each direction, um, you need two station location records because they're location or the direction specific. So I realize that, um, that that might be a little confusing for those not familiar with the format already. And that's really kind of helps uh, establish the need for this guidance document to um, really walk through these different elements of the format and um, try to help make them more understandable. So just kind of a preview, much more guidance in the document. Uh, and so in addition to kind of talking about um, what's included in the count station uh, description, the location record. The guidebook really walks through each field in detail and provides a description of the field, um, an explanation, uh, sometimes providing graphics to help support it. And then it also walks through kind of one example, taking it all the way through the count station description. 
So these are just some additional graphics. So one element of the count station description is noting the type of count. Um, and so there's a code that's used to indicate whether you're just counting pedestrians, bicyclists, et cetera. So this is just an example from the guidance document to try to help make that more, um, more visual and understandable. And then this is another example. Another field from the count station description is indicating whether or not the location is taken at an intersection. So we walk through in the guidance document really what, what does this mean and some kind of tips um, of how to determine if your location is at an intersection or not and using some visual images, some examples to help make that more understandable. So really just want this to be for you guys an example of what's in the guidance document. Hopefully um, get you interested in going there to, to get more information as you work through the TMG format. And then the second element to uh, collecting the and reporting the counts like I indicated is the count data itself. So this describes the count data that's actually collected, um, the numerical count recorded, but it also repeats some fields from the station location record and then provides some additional information, such as the weather during the day that the count was collected. And I want to note that in the recent update to the TMG, there's now an option to include additional data about the count subject. So as shown in this graphic, there's an option to indicate whether helmet use, uh, if helmet use is recorded, if gender is recorded, and if age is recorded. And this is described uh, much more in the guidance document, but this graphic is intended to show that there's a lot of different possible combinations along with this. So for example here, this example of looking through, if we're you're counting helmet use, gender, and age, there's the a multitude of possibilities. So, for example, if um, just for users recorded wearing a helmet, then there's op also the option of uh, male, female, or indeterminate, and then child, adult, or indeterminate. So, um, there's a lot more information on the guidance document about what to do and how to deal with the, all the potential um, iterations of subjects. So, again, just kind of an introduction to what's in the guidance document. And then the final part of the guidance document that I indicated I think is potentially the most useful is the, uh, the last chapter, which includes 29 examples, and they're organized by type. And so this shows the types that we walk through from shared use paths to shared vehicle lanes, bicycle lanes, et cetera. And the, each section kind of introduces the type, the example type, and provides some guidance up front. So for example, the beginning of the shared use paths uh, section provide upfront some particular things to keep in mind if you're uh, reporting a count on a shared use path in terms of how do you understand what facility type your count is on and how do you decide what the direction of movement is. So um, that upfront guidance is provided in addition to kind of real world example locations. So just lastly want to show this is again an example straight from the guidance document of one of those examples. Uh, in this case it's an example from a buffered bike lane in Portland. So you can see the examples introduced with some information up front, kind of describing the location, what's being counted, and why. Um, typically an image from the location, so you can see what it actually looks like. So well, sometimes we view some graphics to show kind of from an, an aerial view what's being counted and help uh, the reader understand uh, what is the overall direction of this, um, this bike lane in this example. And then we walk through all the station location data fields um, in terms of what the actual entry is and then some, some notes saying why that entry is what it is. So again, for those of you not yet familiar with this format, um, this might look a little bit foreign, but hopefully through some of the guidance in the document, um, it will help make this a little, bit, a little bit more usable and something that's a little bit easier to interpret. So I uh, ended there just with my contact information. Um, I think that Dan's provided the link to this guidance document um, to make it available to you guys. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dan so you can have some time for our discussion. Thanks all for listening. OK, thank you very much, Kelly. Um, we are going to get right into our uh, Q&A. Uh, portion of the presentation here. So uh, give me just a moment. I'm going to pull up a presentation slide um, with all of the uh, contact information uh, for our group today. Uh, we never really can get through all of our material and so, uh, or all the questions that are submitted because there's so many and there are a lot today too. Um, so if you don't 
get your question answered, or if you do have a very specific question that you'd rather follow up directly with someone on, um, you can see their information here. I'm also including a link at the top where we've posted the slides and the video recording will be there as well. So if you want to follow back up on any of the resources we shared today. Uh, but let's get uh, right into it. Um, so one of the questions uh, that uh, came up a few times, and I'm sure none of you were surprised having worked maybe directly with communities before on count programs, uh, would be surprised by this question, is um, what would this sort of thing cost me? What am I looking at investing? Am I in a community, especially a few small communities who uh, maybe don't have a lot of resources and they're thinking about maybe making decisions between putting in sidewalks or doing intersection improvements versus using some of their budget for developing count programs. So can you talk at all about, and maybe Krista, I'll ask you first to start and then we can all weigh in um, on it too, but some of the range of options. You've talked about a few different types of count programs and strategies. So do you have a good sense of like what a city or town may be looking at um, for setting something up? Well, I, I've heard of I mean, different agencies. A lot of people start with the um, National Bike Ped Documentation Project manual counting program as an entry point where they can just um, get some volunteers out. Uh, I think um, a lot of programs have started that way and uh, with um, some minimal staff time. Um, and for relatively little, you can buy your first counter. Um, I, I hate putting prices out there, but sure. um, they they can range from 500 to 5,000. To you know, you can pay pay more if you'd like. Um, but getting your first permanent counter um, is a good good investment in the future. And um, so that's pretty low budget, really, um, yeah. to get something in the ground started. Right. And then those programs can grow. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, I'll I'll jump to you as well because you you know you mentioned you did work with all of these pilot uh, communities uh, to go through this process, and you threw a ballpark figure out there, I think, that you provided to them. Right. But uh, what did you find yeah, in their reaction? Yeah. I'd be happy to sort of summarize the, the effect. I mean, we, we were basically issuing grants of about $20,000 to each of these agencies, uh, which in most cases covered purchase of multiple portable counters. Um, I'd recommend actually grabbing the report that, that I mentioned and taking a look at it, because you'll find that these were used in a lot of different ways. Uh, so there were a couple of communities that wanted to just sort of leverage this and add counters to it. There are a few who are just using the counters that they got, but using them to probe around and see what's going on. Uh, so, you know, it's possible to start pretty cheap. Uh, you know, a few thousand dollars for the equipment and spending some staff time moving the stuff around learning how to use it. I think that can be very useful. So, you know, check out the report. It's not as hard as it sounds. Yeah, and I, I would just say that um, I think you and you may, Jeremy, in that report, you probably have maybe some of the people you worked with at these in these agencies, um, and then there are lots of cities around the country that have or NPOs that have programs. I'm sure contacting mm -hmm. some of them directly, they would provide more details. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the the report does include contact information for people at all ten of the agencies, um, and all of them are perfectly prepared to field questions. If you saw them doing something from the report that looks interesting, feel free to follow up. I think everybody who was in the program was very enthusiastic about what they were able to accomplish, uh, which was encouraging to us. Yeah. And uh, I, the next question is more of a, is, is another kind of bigger picture question. Uh, Christine, well, I, I have, know. Yeah. Oh, go I ahead. Want to add one thing. Uh, I want to add one thing to what Jeremy and Krista sure. were saying. And that is, when you're considering a cost, remember it's not just upfront costs, but there are ongoing costs. So mm -hmm. when you're, if you're going to be gung ho and say, well, we want a permanent station, you're talking, of course, a higher cost than having a portable unit. But a permanent station also includes a modem fee, which can range about 400 a year uh, to transmit the data, and a battery replacement about every two years, and that runs another $400. So Make sure that you budget for these. I, I'm familiar with at least one agency that was all gung-ho about putting in equipment, but they didn't budget anything for the ongoing uh, uh, care of that equipment, and it led to problems down the road. Okay. Well, so I can, we, and we had a few other comments sent in questions about other things like you're mention, mentioning, Scott, so not only uh, the ongoing uh, maintenance needs, but um, 
questions about are these targets for vandalism a lot of times uh, and, and does that happen? So that question and then do our friends in uh, northern climates need to be thinking about other maintenance issues that come up with snow and ice that maybe folks in the in more temperate areas might not have to deal with and vice versa. So um, it sounds like there's there are issues uh, associated with those and it might be beneficial then for some of these uh, agencies considering these programs to reach out to others with similar circumstances and maybe get a better read on what their prices might be or Absolutely. overall cost. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Vandalism really is something that you're um, you're going to get to encounter. Uh, the yeah. first the 2015 factors that we developed, we were only able to use seven of our 12 permanent stations because there had been some vandalism to the uh, pedestrian uh, sensors and we lost mm -hmm. weak data here and there. And I wouldn't use the data for factor development unless I had a pretty solid year worth of data. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and we are getting a lot of questions, very specific questions about some, some costs that are very detailed. Um, I would say, to, to follow up on some of those, again, the uh, folks that with ha ongoing programs, maybe some of the pilot programs are running into these issues, the individual cities are, um, are probably great contacts for those. And if you reach out to us, maybe we can refer you to some contact people we know. Um, and then I would think that any of the uh, vendors that you might consider using uh, would have maybe more information for you about what you might expect uh, down the road or, or all of that. So. Uh, we won't spend too much time on just the cost portion because there's a lot we want to cover, but but those are some other ideas of where you could um, where you could take your programs. But but as a flip side to costs, um, a lot of cities may then be seeing dollar figures adding up. How do you how would you pitch uh, at, for on a city level or an MPO level the value of account program? It's not something probably that, that exist in most places, and so there might be a, a position where someone's in, they have to kind of sell this. Uh, why should we get a, invest in this count program? Uh, would any one of our panelists like to take a quick stab at a, a, an elevator pitch that they would use for, um, for getting a count program going? I'll take a crack at it. Okay. One of the uh, beneficiaries, and I, and I think that many of your uh, listeners will say yes, that's intuitive, is the health benefits of non-motorized travel. We all know that we're facing an obesity epidemic, um, you know, diabetes is out of control, and the, and the way to, to, one of the ways to deal with this is through exercise. So there is a very valuable link to make with the health community. And believe it or not, the health community tends to uh, have money. And many times they will issue grants to purchase equipment or to get these programs going. I know that Colorado DOT, which I believe was the first program in the country, um, got its first permanent station, uh, its first few permanent stations uh, funded with a grant from Kaiser Permanente, which is a, a hospital system. Mm -hmm. And so that's one place I would look uh, is to your local a partner with your local health advocates. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. And I, I would say I don't want to read too much into your uh, some of the results that you showed in your slide, Scott. But your your one example of um, showing some uh, volume data uh, before and after of the bridge opening. Um, I, I mean, if you didn't have the count data to look at, how would you really be able to show that your investment might have might have paid off in that way? I mean, that, it would be difficult, I'm sure. Oh yeah. So that's another added value, I think, for a lot of, that we I hear a lot is, is well, when you're uh, looking at trying to justify in future infrastructure investments for peasant bikes, uh, you can show some real change and real data. So I think that that's a value, it seems to me. So any other thoughts yeah. you all about, about that? Yeah, this is, Kelly, I'd maybe add a couple of things to that um, and also maybe note a potential resource to look to is the NCHRP 797 guidance document that um, came out a couple years ago now talks kind of specifically about applications for uh, for this data and think some I think are yeah, definitely maybe more obvious kind of before and after studies to help justify improvements that are made and show a link between increase in volumes or to help prioritize improvements if your agency is looking at a couple different locations to potentially make an improvement to help um, to help maybe use current use as one factor in that evaluation 
definitely some, some safety and exposure applications as well. Um, I also mentioned um, a couple, you've already touched on a couple others as well. Um, and then lastly, just note kind of as we start to see kind of um, ways of measuring and assessing our systems become not just vehicle based, but also pedestrian and bicycle based, that I think there'll be a growing growing need for this data from a, a monitoring perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. Thank you all. Um, I had a question of quite a few of our attendees, I think, are, are coming from um, smaller communities, maybe in more rural locations, where um, it may be less obvious, I guess, where um, if they were to begin a count program, where would the calendars go? What would we really be trying to measure? Um, how do you really justify the cost for a very small community? And I don't know if you all have thoughts on that. Is, is there a, a role to be played by uh, regional organizations or, or MPOs to help assist uh, smaller communities with, with setting up individual accounts in their areas? And I think, Krista, you mentioned some work going on in North Carolina, and I know there are likely some, some of those locations are probably considered to be in the more rural parts of the state. Uh, not to put you on the spot uh, for that, but uh, thoughts on rural small town uh, opportunities for counting? Yeah, I know Washington State, this is Krista, I know Washington State is um, looking into that because they want a statewide representative program and mm -hmm. need to not just sample in, in very urban places, but also in small towns. That would be a state DOT. Okay. Any other thoughts yeah, on this, Yeah, this, this is Jeremy, and I'm, I'm going to sort of piggyback on the last question that I didn't jump in on and this one as well, and just to say, watching what's happening in the transportation system is essentially the backbone of what the Federal Aid Highway Program is currently about. If you look at the performance requirements in MAP 21, the encouragement of agencies top to bottom to do performance-based planning. All of that starts with actually monitoring what's happening in the transportation system. Uh, and I think there are, are sort of positive and negative reasons to be really interested in doing counts. One is just to show that there is actually bicycle and pedestrian activity. It happens everywhere, uh, but because it remains relatively rare compared to motor vehicle traffic, we're often not aware of it. And so I, I would say, particularly for small communities, there could be a benefit in obtaining portable count equipment, setting it up for a couple of weeks at a time, just to get a snapshot of what's going on out there and getting a sense of what's happening. Um, from the negative reason, uh, I would say that you know politically, one has no idea of what happens to uh, bicycle and pedestrian funding in the long run as a carefully separated program from the main highway funding that we have. I mean, agencies are entirely welcome to use standard highway funds to develop bicycle and pedestrian facilities for transportation purposes. Uh, and it's really important to make sure that uh, we start doing things that enable us to uh, flexibly look at biking and walking as part of the transportation system as a whole. So I, and I'll stop with that, but I'd say this is a backstop for being able to make sure that we can continue to do this kind of work regardless of how it's framed in federal legislation. Personally, I think it would actually be very beneficial for communities to start looking more and more at using standard transportation funds. But in order to do that effectively from a planning standpoint, we really need to be able to work off the performance measures, show the role of these modes in the transportation system. And sooner or later, that all comes back to the counts. Absolutely. Great points. Um, uh, Scott, I got a question for you about your program in, um, in, uh, in the Philadelphia area for, for for your organization for Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission um, what what sort of staff commitment or uh, sort of overall number of people does it require to uh, to supervise the uh, cyclical counts uh, and uh, how about your project based counts what what sort of staff commitment are you required to have it seems like a, a lot of work uh, a lot of a lot of attention uh, paid any estimate or ballpark <laughs> Well, um, I, I have to couch that in feathers and pillows. Um, okay. Basically, we were very fortunate here in that when BikePed came along and the decision was made uh, that we needed to move into this area, they basically dumped it on the travel monitoring group, which is my unit. Uh, and so we were very fortunate because we had the history of the motorized. Uh, this office conducts about 5,000 counts a year, motorized, non-motorized, et cetera. We do a, an incredible amount of data collection uh, for our member governments, for the two DOTs, PennDOT and New Jersey DOT, who we love, 
uh, for project managers. Um, so we, we do a lot. If I was to say that uh, what do we have as far as a time commitment, that's kind of tough because all of the people cross the lines between motorized and non-motorized. But I'll take a shot at saying um, <clears throat> I have a field person who I would say is one-third to one-half time non-motorized. And I have one of my office staff who also goes into the field to repair vandalized pedestrian uh, permanent stations and install permanent stations. Um, and I would say he's about 25% of his time uh, on bike ped. So in total, about one person out of a staff um, I have of 10. Great. OK, that's, that's helpful. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, we've got uh, two questions now, uh, at least two. I think a few more sprinkled in there. On the topic of, um, of asking about, we, you know, we've heard a lot about account stations and, and different types of count, uh, technologies here. Uh, some questions about crowdsourced uh, data, uh, user-generated data uh, that, you know, available across a number of platforms um, that is made available to cities, basically where people can kind of track their own rides, track their own trips, and then that data is downloaded and, and maybe sold back to cities or, or, or agencies or provided in that way. Um, I'll ask a all of you, maybe Krista, I'll start with you if that's all right, and yeah. ask about, you know, this is a totally different source of the data. Um, so cities are looking at both, you know, how do they think of them differently, or, or what does one say that the other may not, or, or how can they be used possibly together? Um, so the, the, these crowdsourced data, um, the tricky part is that they're biased, so a certain number of people will use them. It could be an advocacy community, depending on how the app is marketed, or it could be uh, re recreational, if we're talking about the Strava product, for example. Um, so you, you will have a bias of some sort, and so understanding what that bias is is helpful mm -hmm. um, if you want to use that data. But I think um, using it in combination with the count data may be powerful. Um, some people have been looking at that. There's some studies out of Montreal at McGill mm -hmm. um, that have been looking at that specifically and, um, and seeing some positive results to to using the the crowdsourced data in combination with the count data, so the count data can kind of validate well how many people are we missing and at what type of facilities, and then creating some kind of adjustment for that. Um, but a lot of research needs to be done in this area before we can really feel any confidence of of what this is telling us. Is, is it predictable, and and what kind of sample size do we need, and how do we really make sure that our our word, our message is getting out to the right, um, to enough people in the communities. Mm -hmm. and, and for pedestrian travel, it's not as common that, that people would use these apps. So um, this is more of a bicycle uh, okay. specific thing. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts on, on crowdsourced data and, and uh, using it maybe in combination with other types of count data from our panel? Well, Krista is absolutely right in that data fusion is really where it's going to be at. But one thing she didn't bring up, and it's a problem that we've had with crowdsourced data, is that the different apps like Cycle Atlanta or Cycle Philly, when you first roll them out, your bicycling community is really great. They, they will just snatch them up, and they're very diligent about recording. But it's just a part of human nature that we get bored with things after a while. And so participation rates actually start declining within uh, a month or two of the rollout of the app. So the real challenge to the planning community is how do we keep it interesting? How do we keep participation rates high? How do we keep reinventing ourselves so that people will, will so it will seem like something fresh, a fresh product? And therefore, the payoff for us is we get better data. But it's going to be data fusion, just like uh, Krista mentioned, where the answers are going to get come. OK, very good. Any, any other thoughts on that question? OK. Very good. Um, trying to determine our last question that we should ask here, because we are um, quickly running out of time. I, I, I have one, actually. So a few, a few people asked uh, some questions about 
about TMAS. Um, we, we asked the question, if you recall, about who would like to provide data, who would like to use it, and I think even, we only spent a little bit of time on it, but um, there were some questions about how an agency would, would go about using data from TMAS. At what, um, at what scale would they be pulling data from? You know, would it be relevant to their own local community? Would they be getting things for some, maybe some cor good corridor information, or would it be more like a state agency would be finding a lot of count data across their state in, in TMAS and being able to pull that out? So um, Kelly and Jeremy, is that something you could talk about? Is, is yeah, I, I, I'm happy to try and take that question on, Dan, because I, I, the original concept that we had for TMAS in, its, in, in, in the first stages is really to focus on collecting accounts for two reasons. One is to look at trend analysis nationally, because we, you know, I, I used to joke that we know more about boats traveling up the Atlantic intracoastal waterway than we do about bicycles and pedestrians. And I think that's something that we really want to rectify so that when, you know, we as we occasionally do get calls from the press to say, can you tell us about trends in bicycling and walking, we can point people to some actual resource. Uh, so that's job one. Job two is to really start supporting other efforts that we go on in analysis of safety, risk, and exposure, looking at forecasting trends, really trying to understand land use context because all the counts that go in will be very precisely located geographically. You'll know what they're about. We've been encouraging this in other publications like the Separated Bike Bikeway Design Guide that uh, we recently published uh, where there's an appendix there talking about the desirability of doing before and after counts. And so we're really hoping to use this as a resource to help improve the planning tools that are available and make the whole process go better for people so you get a better sense of what you're going to get for your dollars, better idea of how to tell where you should be investing in facilities and so on. In the longer run, for specific agencies to look at this, there's always the comparative notion of like, what are other people doing? What are they finding out? Are the trends that we're seeing here um, uh, comparable to what's happening in other places? Um, I, you know, I, I wonder about that a little bit. I mean, my, my reaction having followed data on bike share systems for a while is that people can be amazingly resourceful once the data is available to come up with remarkably cool things that they can find out about and look at. And so we're, we're actually very hopeful that this resource, um, you know, ignites the imagination of people who are doing bicycle and pedestrian planning so that we can really uh, uh, greatly improve access to those modes. I'll stop with that. Great, great. Uh, Kelly, you talked a lot about the, the formats of the data. And he, again, the question being sort of like what, what can agencies expect to be pulling out uh, and how they can use it. Any additional thoughts in addition to what uh, Jeremy said on that? Um, yeah, I don't think too much more to offer. Um, as a, I, so one thing I didn't touch on, I guess, in the presentation is that parts of the format are are critical that need to be uh, need to be inputted, and other elements are are optional. So the intent was really to make sure that we have kind of the most important critical data um, entered whenever somebody submits counts, but then also give some of these optional elements if they want to provide more specifics about the location or the count itself or the conditions at the time of the count. So something to just I guess be aware of when people are looking at the format too. I think the more they can provide, the better in terms of being able to provide a more robust database. But we also don't want there to be um, obstacles to people using the format. Great. Okay, fantastic. And Krista, I think you had another thought on it. I, I just wanted to put one warning out there. The National Bike Ped Documentation Project um, that many people still use has a format, and they gather counts in two-hour bins. And that is no longer supported by the TMAS format. So that's just a word of warning to anybody who's using that format that you need to break those two-hour bins into one-hour bins and in order, if you want that data, to ever uh, flow to the federal database. Right. And this is Jeremy. I'll tag on that just to say that the defense for that is to make, is goes back to our desire to really make these data statistically as useful as possible. And the trick with the two-hour counts coming as one number uh, is that it makes it really hard to do consistency checks and ensure that the data really means something. Thank you all uh, so much for that. I, I, I unfortunately have to say that we are running out of time for the discussion period. And uh, so what I'll encourage everyone to do, if you still have questions, and I know there are still some out there, please do follow up with us, follow up with our panelists. Um, they have a lot of good information to share. Um, and please refer back to our, our website uh, to find the slides and, and all the other resources we, we pulled together. Digging through some of those, NCHRP Report 797, some of these other guides can be really helpful for answering some of the de detailed questions. So uh, we encourage you to do that. 
Um, I want to let you all know just one more time. Uh, first, we are holding part two discussion on uh, equipment on Thursday, so we'll make a plug again for that same time. Uh, please go register for that if you if you have availability. Um, I want to remind you also that you're going to be receiving an email uh, in about an hour uh, that's going to contain a link to our webinar archive page where you can find uh, all this other information. It will also include the video recording when we get that up probably in a day or so. Um, and uh, it will also contain that email will contain instructions for downloading your certificate of attendance, which you should pass around to the others who are sitting in the room with you to watch the webinar. Um, final reminder, uh, a thing to let you know about is that when you exit the webinar, you're going to see a brief survey uh, that will appear. Uh, we really do appreciate your feedback uh, and your comments on our performance today and all the information we covered. We're interested in hearing about maybe how you might use some of this information or, or uh, questions you still have or issues you're still interested in learning more about. So please take some time uh, to complete that. Uh, and lastly, I just want to say thank you again so much to Kristen Nordback, Scott Brady, uh, Jeremy Raw, and Kelly Lawson for delivering the presentations today. Uh, and thanks to all of you uh, for attending today's PBIC webinar. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.